Hey. Hey, what's up, buddy? How you doing? Yes, yeah, pretty chaotic uh, little turn of events there right before noon, um, but I'm glad to be talking to you. Sorry, man. Everything all yeah, right? It's all right. Yeah, uh, it's okay. It's just like, it's a fluky thing. Like the way that we make our coffee, we have like a like a batch of like the cold. Is this content? A, correct. What's up? Is this content? I don't know. Okay. Should I start recording myself? Uh, you can. I'm recording. Yeah, you can back, right. back, you want, back you, me you up. You want me to do a local record, right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, if it's Hang simple. Uh, Let me open it up. I mean, you're talking about making coffee. I think like, breakfast. That, that, that no, sets no. off alarms where I'm like, yep, this, yep, is, yep. this no, is the show. Got to remember what I'm doing here. All right. I also uh, I don't will... have any content prepared. So I don't want to <laughs> like anything, anything we can fill that 20 minutes with, man. Yeah, I will. I will. I could do the whole thing on just uh, what <laughs> I spent the hours of uh, the minutes between 1148 and 1270. I think, I think the last two times you've been on, we just talk about pandemic things the whole time. Um, yeah. About so we could probably figure out something we can figure it out more, uh, you know, like lighter than that. I am recording myself. Great. In, uh, I'm mono. recording. Yeah, perfect. Oh, right. yeah. That certainly doesn't matter. Um, right. Oh, I have the wrong file. Um, yeah, I'll ask you. Doing? Oh, yeah, I, on, I'll man. tell you what I'm doing. I'm recording a Grizzlies podcast while I'm waiting for you to join the Zoom. So oh, now boy. I have to go to my Fast Break Breakfast podcast. All right, here we are. Here we are. I might have bitten off more than I can chew in my life. <laughs> we can also come back later when you're done doing the other. No, man. No, this is my time. Out. All right. This is, this is the moment we're doing it. Here we go. All right. Joined right now by David Roth. David, how's it going, man? Pretty good, dude. How are you doing? Thank you for uh, being flexible because of my kitchen chaos. You had a we you had a, a, a kitchen mishap. Can you regale us with the details? You were trying look. to tell me before we started recording, and you said the word coffee, and I'm like, if you had a coffee related disaster, that is yep. proprietary Podcast information stuff. of Fast Break Breakfast. So let's yes. get it. Let's get it out now. No, that's true. So I won't tell you about how I'm concerned that one of my turtles is sick. That's not. That's got nothing to do with breakfast. I didn't know you had turtles. I have two of them. And one have of you them always had turtles? Well. Yes. Well, not all. I mean, I was when I was a young child, I didn't have them. Uh, but I got them on the street in Chinatown like 20 years ago. And from a vendor that, or from the sewer? Like from a dude. From okay. a dude with a bucket yeah. full of little baby turtles in it. It wasn't a life-size rat, was it? With a it was yeah it was a it, it was, was very wise yeah. yes it was um <laughs> which is weird because i have my roommate at the time uh who i knew as jeff is actually was krang's kid <laughs> <laughs> it was an nyu thing it was all yeah. i won't go into it um sure yeah the yeah so i was making coffee uh before i came on the podcast with my my friend keith to talk about the fact that i have the same breakfast every time we've done this podcast i've had yeah. the same breakfast today i think i had the same breakfast except for we make coffee. We have like a, it's like a toddy is the name of the, the brand or whatever, but it's like a cold brew thing. Like you soak the, the grounds overnight and then you take a little plug out and coffee concentrate comes out and then you can dilute it. You know, it's like a, you know, one part to two parts and that's your cup of coffee. Uh, it works really well. It's in a tempered glass sort of carafe and somehow I put the carafe down wrong. It bonked the corner of the stovetop. Oh, broke like, uh. like a little porthole got punched in it and like a i don't know how like a quart of coffee concentrate just splashed out some of it got into the stove the igniter wouldn't stop sparking on the uh the gas range so we had to unplug it Yikes. it was uh real weird yeah so messy uh the kitchen sm of all the things you could smell uh after a big kitchen sm uh, spill this is actually pretty good um it just smells like kind of like a um, like a Starbucks at closing time in there. <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, it sucked and it delayed my my opportunity to talk on this podcast. And it did compromise my breakfast somewhat. The toast was cold. Uh, coffee was not as warm as you'd like. And I can't use the stove now until it dries out under there. Is is everything okay though? I mean, it sounds like there's no fire, yeah. there's no fire hazard or anything. No, it could have been worse. It could have been worse because this is like it's a gas range and there yeah. was a spark thing that wouldn't stop sparking. And so like of all the you know things within the realm of possibility that could happen involving sparks and gas this was the most benign because you could really just <laughs> unplug it and the problem was over well, uh, but, but yeah it was a fucking panicking a uh, couple of minutes there because like yeah all the things that could be bad were extremely bad 
Is there also uh, glass everywhere? Wait, was there? No, it's a craft weird about it. It It like, like, oh, okay. It was just that little bit got punched out. It was like a, like a cat burglar was determined to prank my breakfast and podcast availability. Like it was like (laughs) a little circular thing from where it bumped the side of the deal. And that was it. But the thing didn't shatter. I mean, it looks perfectly fine, except for it's got a hole in it. Well, speaking of shattered glass, um, uh, we have, like most people do, um, we had a mirror that we had just left out of doors. Uh Um, It was like a, I don't even remember honestly where it came from. It was a four foot tall mirror where at one point I'm like, should we throw this away? And I I took it out in our backyard. We have a deck. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just leaned it against the deck and it's been leaning against the deck for years. Yeah. This is just because this is like, Hey, advantages of yeah, having like, Oh, you know what? Who, who, who doesn't want a four foot tall mirror outside? You're going to your car. One last check to make sure everything looks yeah. all right. What if we, something, so yeah. we have an outside backyard, um, pretty large mirror. Well, last night I hear this gigantic thud and I'm sitting in my basement watching, um, the NBA. I'm watching Jokic and Zubac do battle. I was also watching that. Ooh, maybe we'll talk about it in a second. But maybe, I maybe, but I think I, I want to get more into my coffee spill. But first, I'd like to hear more. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about what happened to your mirror. So I hear, I hear this loud thud, and we do. We have trees above us, mm-hmm. large, giant, horrifying trees that have fallen on our things before. They've fallen on our roof. They've fallen on our cars. They've fallen oh, on the same deck. I hear this thud. I'm like, oh, it's another tree. By the way, we've had arborists look at our tree, and we say, hey. Should we take anything off of this tree? Should we fix this tree? And these arborists who are in the business of charging people money to take trees down are like, no, nah, you're good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. They're like, really? It's like right over our house and cars. He's like, yeah, if it's my house, I wouldn't do it. That tree's fine. So anyway, I heard this thud. I'm like, oh man, something got smashed again. Um, I don't see any tree branches, but our mirror, our good luck backyard mirror has fallen down. It is in about maybe 22 pieces. Uh, it's still there. This was at That's, least, yeah, I mean, it was about 14 like hours ago. It. It's cold outside. School got canceled because uh, we got a little glaze of ice in, in Nashville. So, like, uh, we're not going outside. I'll, I'll pick up the pieces. Yeah. A little bit later, it'll be there when you're ready for it. I feel like that's one of those things too, where like, yeah. you know, if you if you can leave a mirror out there for four years, at the very least, like giving it right. a sort of a a proper send off, like a 24 hour sort of like a period of, of just you know like ref- you don't want to say reflection but you know just <laughs> yeah. an opportunity to i like that I, let I it all that. kind of marinate a little bit and listen if anyone's out there judging a backyard mirror like if you if you're a beard grower you know it's disgusting trimming your beard indoors there's no sanitary clean way to do that i haven't invested in one of those beard bags uh that i've that i've maybe seen online i just go outside to my backyard mirror i that, take care of it all outside and sweep what it a the luxury ground. that is yeah. just to be able to like step outside with like some scissors or a trimmer and be like, yeah. I'll be back when I'm, I'm just going to consult this mirror real quick and handle my business. There were, there were times in my life where I would go outside with the scissors and, and I'd have my, my full year of growth. And I'm like, you know, what? I need to trim this down. And I'm trying to catch an angle of, of like the, 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 the glass door. I'm just, you know, I'm looking at a window to get a reflection. Yeah. No, no, I don't have an outdoors mirror. Well, I did, but it's now. What, it's now do you have any sense of how it broke? Was it just get blown over or something or? I, you know, honestly, part of me in my ignorance to science wants to believe like, did, like, did cold weather kill it? Yeah. I, like, see, was it sleeting? Me- was it too warm two days ago or something? Is this, is this a change of, of temperature in the glass and it just gave up? That's I what I'd like to, to believe. That you're talking to someone who is absolutely <laughs> stupid enough to have had the same thought. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. You can't have glass outside. If it gets down in the 20s, forget it. Yeah. Right. If it goes from 60 to 20, it's done. Right. Um, what is that based on? I was never taught anything remotely like that because it is almost certainly totally false. Um, and yet here we are in more or less open agreement about it. So, so Zubac and Jokic. All right. Yeah. On Wednesday night, they put on They're a show. Zubac a lot of credit by mentioning him in the same breath as Jokic. Zubac had 32 getting, points. He did, but he got hammered all a game. career high 32 points. He even had had his, he got fouled out. But then they challenged it. He got to stay on the court, yeah. um, which was great to see. No, this is this is a stat from this uh, Twitter user with the Twitter account called NBA Crazy Stats, and it's not a misnamed account. Yeah. NBA Crazy Stats has brought us a crazy stat. 
this i mean this in general just the fact that uh you, when you name your account that you know you better fucking bring you better it. yeah you, be, you better bring it and uh, this yeah. guy brought it uh Jokic and Zubac combined for 81 points, which uh, in the last, what is this, 50 years? Since 1970, that's uh, the third most points starting centers have ever combined to score. Wow. The most points ever combined to score. Was that it? Did Embiid and Bamba have more last night? You're on it. It's Embiid and Bamba. Yeah. Who combined for 82 points, which tied Bob McAdoo and Dave Cowens wow. from 1974. Uh, so last night, we had two of the three highest scoring starting center showdowns in the last 50 years. Wow. And it was two of them where it's like basically the two best players in the NBA this year. Yes. And then the other two guys are like, Zubach to me is like, I am higher on him than actual Clipper fans are because he does like fun stuff and he doesn't defend very well. And there's a lot of, you know, limits to his game and stuff, but he does cool dunks and he tries real hard. And like, I, I've enjoyed watching guys like that. I mean, you say he does cool best. dunks is kind of a very generous interpretation of his game, but I'll, I'll allow it. I mean, they're not like cool, like the sort of thing where you're like, wow, how did he come up with that one? I we're mean, not John he's Morant we're talking about. We're, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> but Bamba is a guy that he had seven three pointers yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, which is not something that I knew that he was all even in the first half to do, man. He he does hit three pointers. He, he's a unique, intriguing, still prospect. Yeah. But he, but like, like Zubac, he's basically part of a three headed center rotation. You don't expect those guys to erupt. Yeah, Zub, uh, the uh, um, the Bomba game against Embiid, Embiid scores 20 of the Sixers first 22 points. I turn the game off or I'm, yeah. you know, I'm flipping around. I got multiple games going, but that early uh, 7 p.m. Eastern start. Once I saw Embiid had 20 of the first 22, I'm switching to another game. I'm like, oh, let's see yeah. what Cavs nets. Let's see what better teams are doing. And then I see at halftime that Bamba scored 28 in the first half. And I'm like, and what? The Sixers, were, Sixers were down at the half, right? Yeah, like, like they were suddenly down. And now I got I to gotta juggle that game. So I, have, I, I am not at the level this year. This is like, I don't think that this is exactly bragging. Like, I have not seen the magic. I know that oh, they're bad. Sure. And every time I see their box score, it's like, it's the names I recognize, but they're all playing weird amounts of minutes. <laughs> Terrence were also pay like 35 minutes one night and then like eight minutes the next night. And like, I'm assuming there's a reason for that, but I don't know what it is because I don't watch them. I, th I think Terrence Ross is one of the guys. And by the way, nickname Human Torch. It's one of the best nicknames for a guy who has terrible shooting statistics yes. ever. Yeah. He just never, ever puts it together. Every night, I think they put him in. And they're like, let's see if the human torch has it. And most nights he does not. And they pull yeah, him he's out. up there sparking like my <laughs> stove with like yeah, 16 exactly. ounces of coffee concentrate hanging out. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they, and they keep, I think like, this is the year they really want to trade him because like I think they've won eight games. The Magic yeah. are, are terrible. And they're like, we, we really would like to trade him. But he, he hasn't torched in. Let's see. He Are torched like on January 9th or something. Okay. That's uh, nice. On that January 9th, ago. he scored 30. He scored 32 points in the last five games. He's gone 17 points. Then the 10 points, the last three, he's combined to score seven, mm. seven total points. The human that torch doesn't seem like a positive trend. I mean, just, you can really see the graph in your, in your mind's eye Man, of that it, declining. If, if people call you human torch, though, you just got to you let it go. You live with it. You, you thank whatever has happened uh, for that to happen. He's the a type of player, though, that like, um, you know, you and I have been watching basketball games long enough, you know, yeah. even with like, you know, admittedly inexpert eyes to where you're just sort of like a guy that can do everything that you want a basketball player to do, like will always fool you like <laughs> Ross can shoot. He can jump like theoretically he can defend a bunch of different positions. And yet, like, I, I'm not sure that he's good. Like, and I'm not sure that he'll right. ever be better than he is. Well, he's also in a weird spot where you'd think on this team. Yeah, this is where it's you so bad. Stats. You seem like you would put some stats up. But here's a here's a very illustrative. Yeah, this is his like Ricky um, Davis moment, and he is not rising to meet it. So from uh, from uh, January 2nd to January 9th, he had a five game stretch where he averaged 22 points per game, uh, shooting 49 mm -hmm. percent from the field. And then he followed that up in his last five games with, uh, we're going to say, 6.8 points per game on 31% from the field. So that's just the roller coaster. 1% from the field. It's, it's not great. So no. 
last night also in the NBA, and you know, this feels like a human torch type thing for someone who is not Terrence Ross. I don't know. I haven't been tracking this, but last night there were five players who scored over 25 points in a half. We have Mo Bamba who did it. Joel Embiid did it. Jokic did it. Yeah, Jokic did in the first half too. Um, like. Also, Trey Young did it. Um, who, who's who's my fifth here? Bamba's getting himself onto all kinds of weird lists. You got to respect that. Oh, my guy, Jaron Jackson Jr. He scored 27 points in the second half against the Bucks. And like, I haven't tracked this. But in the last in the last week, ten guys have had a, a twenty five point or more half, and I'm like, is this normal? Yeah. Is this like, it this feels unusual, but I don't know. I actually haven't looked it up to see if it is out of the ordinary. It feels this whole season feels stranger than it may actually be. Like, I mean, I guess maybe it's the fact that this is the first one in two years that like started on time is unfolding more or less in a regulation sort of length, give or take. You know, some of the the COVID postponements that we had, and yet because they're playing through this stuff the way that they are. There's like, I mean, I don't know what the number will be of guys that are like making their NBA debuts this year, but I feel like at the end of the year, it's going to be three or four times higher. Oh, oh yeah. It's, it's already been like over a hundred. And so there's this experience of watching a game. Like I watched clips nuggets last night that like, at this point I've seen the Clippers enough times that I'm like used to, like, I know who branded Boston is and I know who Amir <laughs> sure. coffee is and like, yeah. they're, you know, they're Clippers now in my, my mind. And yet like, there's still every time you put a game on, or, I mean, it was the same thing with the nugs that there's like, they're missing enough guys, not because of injury, but just because of this like normal churn of illness that is just the NBA in this year that there's always one or two guys on the floor that like, I don't even remember playing in college. <laughs> Like, yeah. just like yeah. the guy that on, on the nugs is like Davon Reed or something like that. Like, yeah. I don't know who that fucking guy is, man. Sure. Like, and I follow this pretty closely. He also ran on the court uh, when the game was not over last night. Mm. This was also bizarre. I don't know if you noticed this. At the very end of the game, uh, Jokic locks down his 40-point triple-double with this incredible pass to Aaron Gordon in the corner where Jokic is double-teamed across the court. Flings it right to Aaron Gordon, the shooting pocket. Aaron Gordon hits the game winning shot with one second left. It's an incredible uh, pass. I recommend this, that everybody look it it's up. It's an incredible pass. Jokic, after the game, said that's not an incredible pass. I do that yeah. every game. It's a regular pass. Um, I would love to know what he considers the incredible passes, but it was a great pass. Aaron Gordon hits a shot, and Davon Reed thinks the game is over. He thinks the shot clock buzzer is the actual buzzer for the end of the game. He sprints onto the court. The Clippers do not have a timeout. Oh, I don't even think I noticed that. I was watching sprints. it live. Well, too, but... There's a reason you did not notice it. The reason you did not really notice it is because the ESPN broadcast makes almost no mention of what happened. Wow. There is a technical foul called on Davon Reed. Luke Kennard shoots a free throw to cut from three-point game to two-point game. ESPN shows none of this. They don't show Luke Kennard shooting the free throw. They don't mention that he made a free throw. Um... The commentators, I believe it's Mark Jones and Richard Jefferson. The commentators are saying, I'm pretty sure Davon Reed should be called for a technical foul. Guess what? He was called for technical foul. <laughs> and then they say, well, I guess he wasn't called for a technical foul. The guy shot a free throw. I was so confused because Reggie Jackson almost makes a half quarter. And when he yeah. misses the half quarter, uh, they would have won. I think yeah, this, this, it, yeah, so it was says they would have won. And I was like, wait a minute. I thought it was tied when Aaron Gordon. Yes. I, I oh, thought it was wow, tied. That is and so, so I'm like, wait, it's 130 to 128. I thought it was 130 to 127. So I go and look at the game log, and there it is. With 1.4 seconds left, Luke Kennard made technical free throw. And they're at the game. This is not a remote broadcast game unless they, like, did a blue screen thing to, like, import yeah, no, them. I think it, I think they, they showed were them there. they were in the crowd. Right. But they oh, somehow missed really it. Luke weird. Kennard missed, shot a free throw. They didn't tell us about it. This was the most bewildering end of a game where I'm like, wait, the score's wrong. And that kind of makes up. me wish that Jackson had sunk that shot because then they would have had to explain why the game was over. They would have been so, they would have never figured it out. Like, as it is, I feel like they were just trusting that it was, you know, I mean, obviously there's people watching that game in other parts of the country, but it was like, you know, almost one in the morning where I am. And so at some point they're just probably like, he's not yeah. really paying attention. Like, and like I saw Luke Kennard make a technical free throw earlier in the game. Maybe I'm just like going to con that into the space where he I mean, made this. Maybe, maybe I'm incorrect, but I feel 
I'm not incorrect about that Luke Kennard made this free throw. That that play occurred. ESPN yeah. did not broadcast it. But maybe I'm incorrect that I dreamed the image of, of Mark Jones and Richard Jefferson sitting with like the Nuggets fans behind them uh, broadcasting well, the game. I assume they were at the game too. It, it and, was so odd. Yeah, I mean, that is a weird one. You, that's of, of all the ways that a game could be weird this season, though. That one at least is like acceptably normal. Like it happened. That's just yeah. a TV blooper. It's not the sort of thing where like. Stanley Johnson scores 20 points for two different teams in the same week or, or Lakers fans are like Stanley Johnson is our best player. Yeah. He's one of our most incredible. This is incredible. By the way, I'm trying not to talk about the Lakers because everyone talks about the Lakers, but currently to me, the Lakers are so incredibly interesting. Maybe this is just what happens to NBA podcaster brain. After you do it for several years, you're like, let's just talk about the biggest stories, but like Vogel. So they, they lose to the Pacers on, on Wednesday night. Um, the story from the game, if you will, is that Westbrook did not close the game. They took him out. He Westbrook was having a, another terrible game. And there's now reports today that says, um, you know, because Vogel's on the hot seat. That, that's yeah. been out there. Um, he was almost fired after another game. But Vogel's on the hot seat. But it came out today that he was given permission by management recently to take Westbrook out of the game, which is also known as he was given permission recently to, to coach, coach the team. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like, that's a hilarious combination of stories. For like, man, on the hot seat. Like, and by the way, now he's allowed to actually take this guy out of the game. Who, so you have to ask like Rob Polinka about rotation decisions? Apparently you have to, yes, have to ask uh, Kurt and Limba, uh, Linda Rambis about who you can take in and out of the game. But he now has the green light to not play Westbrook sometimes. Through another <laughs> two for 15 shooting game or whatever. I feel yeah. terrible for us. I mean, this is just, he's had this, like, I guess each of the last couple of seasons, he's had this really awful start. Yeah. And he's just, he's Russell Westbrook. His whole job is to keep doing Russell Westbrook type things and to try them over and over again. But like he is shorting out in ways that I've not seen professional players really short out this year, like just missing shots in ways that like, I've not seen anyone miss shots. And like, I don't know how, especially, I mean, if your, your job is on the line or whatever, but I wasn't clear on what, his role was going to be on a winning version of this Lakers team before the season. If he was good, Russ, like at this point, like you can't, like he's more unhelpful to the team than Avery Bradley or whoever it is. Well, I know I can't, that's not God. So Avery Bradley, Bradley was, tricking coaches into thinking he's good is, is I think more damaging than Russell Westbrook shooting 20%. I, that's my opinion. So I don't have facts to back that, that up, but <laughs> the Lakers started yesterday. Bradley was the only one that was drafted after George W. Bush was president. <laughs> he was drafted in 2010. Yeah, yeah. Ariza in- was taken in. Uh, I saw that they put Ariza in the starting lineup. You got Dwight Howard. I mean, those yep. guys were tremendous uh, 10 years ago. Yes. Um, I mean, it really, it was the real, like, opening a pack of 20, 2011 tops and being like, oh, nice. Look at that. It's amazing. Yeah, each one of those, wow, four of the five starters have been in the league for 12 years. Yeah. Say it. Wow. I mean, more than that. And some like Ariza and Howard were drafted in 2004 and LeBron was drafted Whoa. in 2003, which is why I forget I mean, Ariza's like, that old. He's not. He played one year in college and, okay. uh, and Dwight didn't play any. So they're not. Ariza's like 36, which yeah. is old for an NBA. I know this because like last night I was looking it up where I was like, how old is Trevor Ariza? Because I thought of him <laughs> as being 29 for a really long time, but sure. I thought of him for being as being 29 when he was like on the Knicks or whatever, you know, like, and that was. <laughs> <laughs> I, apparently at this point half my life ago the the thing with the lakers that I, is kind of like fascinating to me is that i think a lot of the the later lebron teams have like danced right up to this line of having just so many old guys that they actually become bad and this is the first time somehow that they've gotten all the way over it <laughs> and i don't know like what you do necessarily to like sort of I guess they traded Rondo and stuff like that, but you can't like rebuild or like sell off a lot of these. Just, guys, I, man, not- you got to get someone who has the, I guess, permission of the ownership to not play the old guys. Yeah. And that, that's my personal simple opinion. Like yeah. you just got to roll with like, be that hard to do. But- Malik Monk, Taylor Horton, Tucker, Austin Reeves. And then you play Westbrook, LeBron and Dwight Howard and AD. I think it's your, that's your team right there. You got to give up on Ariza and Bradley and even, I don't know. Carmelo. Yeah. You talk about Melo had a brutal defensive error <laughs> last night down the stretch where it was just kind of like similar to Westbrook where, you know, you watch the tape and you're like, I don't know what was even going on here. Like he just like, it was like a glitchy video game thing where he like abruptly ran towards the paint, leaving Karis Levert open at the top 
for a three and it was just like there was no reason for him to be going there like it was just kind of like some a malfunctioning joystick issue well no, and also uh, apparently that was what finally led to westbrook getting benched was he was he was under explicit instructions do not let karis levert drive left and he just drove left and shot a layup and they're like you're out let's i want to go back let's close on this you um you talked about how it feels like a strange NBA season and maybe it is for whatever reasons. I think there are some ways in which this season, even beyond uh, health and safety protocols and such has made this definitely odd. Like there's no arguing. This is odd. There are, there are three players who I think very unique to this NBA season have made this one of the strangest professional sports seasons I can remember. Um, One is Zion Williamson. Who's just probably not going to play. He might be hurt, but he's a big star. Looking forward to him playing all year. I don't think he's going to play a game this year. There's Ben Simmons, who's on a max contract, who's just said, you know what? I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to play. I'm not going to get paid. At least Zion's getting paid because he's yeah. hurt and he's rehabbing and whatever. He's hanging out in Portland. Simmons um, is boycotting the concept of being a professional basketball player. Ben Simmons is just quitting the team. Or yeah. not qu- quitting basketball. He's just been like, you know what? I'm good. I don't need... $33 million this year. I'm all right. And then, and then there's Kyrie who was also going to do the same thing. said, you know what? I don't want to get a vaccine. I'm just not going to play. And then the nets are like, you know what? Things aren't going great for us. We actually are going to let you play some road games. So now they're in a situation where he plays road games. I think he's up to five games on the year. Um, if they end up placing, if they end up facing the Raptors in the postseason. He can't play any games. Um, yeah. But I think those three things are the strangest. And since like you have an encyclopedic knowledge of basically all sports, uh, that is very generous. Uh, not well. Really. All right, listen, you follow baseball is what I'm trying to say. Yes, all right, I, that's I fair. That's all I'm trying to say. Accurate. I don't know anything about baseball. <laughs> um, is there anything like? I just want to like focus it on Ben Simmons. Is there anything like what Ben Simmons is doing, which is a man who has a four-year, hundred-plus million-dollar contract still, and it's just like. I would prefer not to get paid this season. The only thing close in my mind that I can think of is when Le'Veon Bell in the NFL, yeah, like a holdout, he held out like they, 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 he had a, a $14 million contract where he's like, you know what? I don't want to play. And he held out hoping he would get a bigger contract. He didn't really, he just basically just said, I'm not going to play this season. But the difference for me in NFL running back, choosing not to play is basically adding years to his life. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like there's, there's... Also, that's like it wasn't the first time that somebody had been like, I, you know, they get that what they call the the franchise tender or whatever yeah. in the NFL. And then they some guys don't like it because it locks you in. And, yeah. like, you know, it's a good amount of money, but it's basically like they can team can keep sort of rolling it over. You don't have the agency that you want as a professional. And I don't think he was the first guy to like do that type of holdout. As I recall, I think Sean Gilbert did it. But like it was not it's not crazy. The Simmons thing is weird because it has it seemingly nothing to do with money like that. It was basically that like he something happened to him during the postseason last year. It became clear that the team either didn't trust him or that he was so untrustworthy that he could not continue being on the team. And then just nothing happened. That's the part of it that's like bizarre to me, like Zion, whatever it is that's wrong with him, I think that like. I don't know if you give credit to the Pelicans for this or whatever. Like, we don't really know what it is. Like, it's a mystery lower body ailment that has coincided with him abruptly becoming a 330 pound man, you know? But like the Pelicans are famously or infamously the worst in the league at rehabbing injuries, at keeping their players healthy. They basically use the Saints training team. Well, so uh, they used, they the used to. It, yeah. It, it is true that they, for a long time, they had this, they, they, they still, they still have the reputation. Like, refined the They process. have, like, they've changed, they've changed their, their, their health, their, uh, their rehab team, their, their physical therapists, everything that, that they hired the people from the Suns who were like the famous. Oh yeah. The that's best. like the ones that you hire. So like they're, they're supposedly have, they're no longer sharing a doctor with the saints. They're like doing as well as they can. They just had this bad luck of, again, maybe it is just luck that Zion has this thing in his there, foot, this bone that won't heal. Yeah. Um, that was and he's heavy. Like and so not that, a crazy outcome for a guy that's got right, like yeah. that kind of body and that yeah. kind of game and stuff yeah. like all these things could sort of happen. The, the Simmons one is especially bizarre to me too, because I don't, you know, there's like all these stories about they're, they're going to trade him and where it might happen. And mostly these stories are told in the negative in like that kind of garbled Shams Charania language where you're like, 
it, you're basically having to like unpack every sentence uh, to its component parts and then try to put them back together because he did not do that before publishing it. But there is like, so I know the deals that won't happen. I know that Sacramento yeah. doesn't want to buy his Harris or whatever, which is, you know, it's more than knowing nothing, but it is also like, it's not affirmatively knowing anything. I kind of feel like Maury at this point is so committed to a deal or a return that just might not be coming. Like there's, I don't feel like they're going to trade him. Like they should, they kind of have to, but like what value does a guy who seems as you said, like quite happy not playing basketball. Like if you're the Kings or the Pacers or any of these kind of like desperate teams that are, you know, in that conversation now, like you really think he's going to show up? I don't, yeah, I have like, no are idea. Are you sure that he would? I wouldn't give, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, that's, that's the weird part about it where it's like he said, apparently is at least clutch has said that, Ben Simmons is happy to go anywhere else besides Philadelphia and will play, but it's hard to ignore the fact that you look at that postseason thing where what in a seven game series, he attempted two field goal attempts in, in yeah. the fourth quarter of the entire series. I believe it was just yeah. two. And then it's like, all right, well you combine that with them now just being like, I'm not playing for this team. Why am I unloading all of these trade assets for this guy? Like, this is the guy right. I, I want to spend all my draft stuff on. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's a hard thing for me to envision. And he's um, such, I mean, he really is a unique and really good player. When I really like him. Like, running. I think he's cool, man. Like, me too. As far as me too. The love game, I just, love like, it. Him running the floor is sick to me. Just visually, yeah. it's really cool to watch. Yeah. Because he's so big and he's so fast. And yeah. like, and yet, like, he hasn't improved exactly either. You know, that like, it, and some of that is, you know, the basketball's hard. You know, I haven't really improved as a basketball player over the last 10 years either, uh, <laughs> if I'm being honest with myself. But there is, like, all these, like, tapes of him, you know, from the offseason and stuff where it's just him playing, like, a half-court game against his cousins. And he, like, hits a three, <laughs> and people are like, well, well, eyes emoji, you know? And it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't see that. Like, I think I see a guy that does not really seem that interested in continuing to play basketball. Yeah, I don't, I mean... I feel like that he doesn't improve narrative. Basically, I don't remember hearing that until the postseason last year, and then that became that has become the predominant narrative, and, and possibly yeah. it's correct. He's just so good at basketball, and he's so unique, and he's like, I have, a, I'm, I got a soft spot for guys who can't shoot. I just, I yeah. do. Like, I enjoy guys. Oh, defense first. Uh, he, he plays a unique style that no one else does, and he and he can't hit the broadside of a barn. I'm in, and yeah. uh, and now it I'm also like, seems like the sort of thing where yeah. you could. If he didn't insist on having the ball in his hands all the time, which I yeah. think is a, an issue for Philadelphia, it would be fun to plug a guy like that into a really good team. Like to think about what somebody who can do that sort of things would do. Like, obviously it's not going to happen, but like anywhere on Golden State, stick him in yeah. there and give him like, yeah. I mean, that would be sick. Like uh, with a great coach and with a real opportunity to like create a role that's never existed in basketball before, that would be cool. It's just like, that's clearly not going to happen in Philadelphia. And I feel like the teams that he's like, I mean, nobody goes to Sacramento and gets better there. I can't the Sacra man, the Sacramento trade rumors are like bumming me out because yeah. they're, they're not going anywhere. And now they're like, Oh, they're actually in the DeMontis Sabonis sweepstakes. I'm like, Oh man, but like, like they'll why? never be good with DeMontis Sabonis. Like he's yeah. fine. He's a pretty good guy, a pretty good player. Fringe all-star dude. Like, uh, but but also a classic guy that like spends five years in Sacramento and you totally forget he exists. Yes. Like it's like the, he yeah. it would be like the, the Vucevic experience in Orlando and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. It's like for 100%. sure it's 2010 in that sort of scenario, like 20 points and 10 rebounds. It's yeah. just like also for a team that wins 26 games and you forget they exist for yeah. months on end. Well, on that Sacramento bummer note, let's mm. end the show. Uh, David, thanks so much, man, for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, all man. you listeners out there, go check out Defector.com. Uh, David, I look forward to the next time. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Check. All right, good. Um, I thought man, the day I was wearing a tie. Man, you look amazing. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Same to you. As always, thanks, buddy. Are you getting younger? Are you getting younger? Did you oh, get a haircut? No, I look, I look horrible. Um, all right. It's now time for the last drop. I'm joined by attorney Carl Epler. Carl, how's it going? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Good to see Man, you again. 
Doing great. It's good seeing you. Uh, I thought I would ask you to come on in regards to some breaking news. Not breaking news. This week, though, Chandler Parsons officially retired from the NBA. According to his lawyers, according to his lawyers, uh, he sustained career ending injuries in a car wreck. And um, then those lawyers fed NBA newsbreakers uh, Shamshrania to say that. Due to a substantial settlement in this case, now Chandler Parsons is done with basketball. I just had a few questions. I thought maybe you could shine some light on uh, on these circumstances. Also, you to let the listeners know, you're a Grizzlies fan. You are absolutely uh, somewhat went familiar. School, went to law school in Memphis. I hey. performed with the Grizz line. Oh, the- you're that's you're a Grizz, a former Grizz liner. You're basically that's famous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and you're also. Also familiar somewhat with the basketball stylings of this Chandler Parsons. I am. He has broken our hearts many times. So I do want to spell out, this is not a legal disclaimer. This is just like to make sure I'm not a horrible person. Um, Chandler Parsons was in a car accident. He was a bad one. Yeah. And there's no doubt about it. He was struck by a drunk driver, which is terrible. Horrible luck for him. What? At two o'clock in the afternoon, I found out. Yeah, middle of the day. Middle of the day, coming back from a Hawks practice. So we don't know how badly Chandler Parsons got injured. We do. We only know what his um, law firm, which you're not a member of. Uh, it is a Nashville no. law firm, a famous Nashville law firm. Uh, big pers- law firm. Nationwide. Very, <laughs> oh, very, very big nationwide, but based in Nashville. And um, uh, the personal injury lawyers, and uh, they... They claim career-ending injuries, severe brain trauma, and, and all these yeah. things. Traumatic brain injury, um, a herniated disc, torn labrum. I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds bad. Yeah, so I don't, I, I'm wishing Chandler good health. I'm sorry this happened to him. So we don't know how badly Chandler Parsons is hurt. We just know, again, what the personal injury lawyers have told us in, in their press releases. However, there were some things. Uh, in the new um, commercial that came out for Morgan & Morgan, the law firm featuring Chandler Parsons, uh, there, there have been some statements in their case that I find to be outright incorrect or just blatant lies, but I don't know how this works in a legal sense. So maybe maybe you, you, can, you can share some of this with me. Uh, Chandler Parsons claims, and through extension, his attorneys claim, uh, that this one, this injury was career-ending most NBA fans, all of us, grabbed the low-hanging fruit of his career was already over. So what does Morgan and Morgan have to prove uh, to a – is this a jury? Is this the judge? What, 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 what do you do for the settlement here? Sure. So what probably happened, um, and I don't have any more facts than you do, but just uh, knowing a little bit about personal injury and you know these types of claims – you know, you get injured and someone is at fault for that injury, right? In this case, it's clear, pretty clear that driver was at fault. Yes. Um, you know, and just like any other accident, you know, you, you have car insurance. Hopefully that other driver has car insurance. You make a claim. Now, obviously, uh, Chandler Parsons has pretty extensive injuries. He's got a lot of uh, medical bills, probably therapy, a lot of those types of things. So you're going to make a claim to your insurance company or and they're going to send it to the person who's at fault, their insurance company. And there's a good chance that that driver doesn't have enough coverage, right, to actually cover all these potential damages. Um, and what is likely going to happen is Chandler Parsons is going to have to ask his own insurance company to cover those things, right? Uninsured motorist type coverage, or he may have other policies on himself, I would assume, you know, for yeah. maybe um, these types of injuries or maybe even like disability insurance. I'm not sure what, you know, the NBA might even require or his team may require, or the, the team may have on it him. It seemed like the so Hawks could, would have also had some form of insurance on him. I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. And so there could be a couple different things going on when they, you know, when the commercial says settlement, it may be more than one type of settlement and it may be with a, more than one insurance company because that's where all the money's flowing because this individual who, you know, decided to drink and then slam into his Rolls Royce, yeah, he hit, he hit, he hit uh, a Rolls Royce. It was the second car he hit while turning into traffic. Um, oh, I did not. Okay, thanks. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's um, there's a lot of things going on here. Um, I would think that 
Chandler Parsons is not going to sue this individual because there's no way this individual could pay out this type of claim. So again, based on the grainy video, um, I don't think the driver of this very old Honda Civic uh, hmm. probably has the money to not only yeah, to, to recoup much of anything. I mean, one for Chandler Parsons injuries also just to fix the Rolls Royce. I mean, for, yeah, exactly. Right. Maybe even to get the towed. So <laughs> I would think, you know, this is probably a, an agreement between some insurance companies and what Chandler Parsons attorneys are going to say is like, he's laid out. It's like, look, this, it's ending his career. He's a, he's a, what fairly young was he like early thirties, I think. Yeah. Relatively young for a guy at the end of his career, but we know he hadn't been playing because of all these Very, actual yeah. basketball had, injuries that he's had. That's had some yeah. long times in his life where he was not playing basketball, but employed by a basketball team. Yeah. So uh, they're going to, to say like, you know, that they're putting out in the press release, well, this ended his career. And, you know, so you're going to not only owe us for the current damages that were caused by this accident, you know, we want the future losses, right? The loss of earning capacity, they call that. So that's, that's the type of damage you can get when you're injured. You can also get you know, obviously the property loss, the medicals, there's um, loss of enjoyment of life, which is a different kind of damage. You know, you don't get to do the things you want to do. Loss of consortium, you, you have, you know, it affects the relationship with you and your loved ones, you know, um, emotional distress, which I'm sure there was some of that if he's, you know, depressed and, you know, also dealing with the rehab and all those things. Traumatic brain injury, obviously, is, you know, can be very serious and life altering. So all of those things, are going to go into what these attorneys are going to be asking for to compensate Chandler Parsons. Um, but now, how do you actually prove what his, you know, back to your original question, if he's at the end of his career, he was, you know, suffering through a lot of injuries and he didn't have a contract or he was up. He was, go- his contract was expiring. He was at okay. the, he was at the tail end of this massive contract that our Memphis Grizzlies gave him. Um, oh, that same one. Okay. This is the same contract. So, the, the the thing that I, I'm wondering is, do, do was a witness called? Was an NBA expert witness? Do, do they have an, 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 a general manager for an NBA team to they say like, would. oh, yeah, he's definitely going to sign another multi-million dollar lawsuit? Because that's, I mean, a contract? Because that's just false. The idea that he was going to sign a multi-year contract, we know for a fact that's not true. It's just NBA watchers. Like, no team right. is going to give him one a multiple-year deal. And he says in the advertisement, like, like a multi-million dollar deal. I wanted to sign another, another multi-million dollar deal. Well, I do too. But no what one was chance. going to give him. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's absolutely patently false. So I'm curious how do, do they go about. They make that claim, and then it's backed off, and then they reach the settlement or something? Right. I think you start there. Uh, but all the things you just mentioned are what an insurance company who does not want to pay anything if they don't have to, they're going to come back with and say, well, okay, we've looked at comparable players and, you know, we've looked at what other players, you know, whether they're coming back from injury or whether they're this age or whether they play in this market, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to go into it. Yeah. There can be experts. If, if it went to trial, you know, if they actually had to sue them over it and got into a fight, This would be a huge question and they would both sides would hire experts and they would say, here's a forensic economist and he's looked at the market. He's looked at the league. He's looked at people like Chandler Parsons who are coming back from injury and, you know, he's only worth this much or here, you know, maybe even press reports, although that's not, you know, not going to get a lot of weight behind that. But there are going to be experts in the field that are going to look at what was he making? What would a player like him make in the future? What would this player make? You know, how much did this injury really, you know, lead to him not being able to play anymore? Which that question is probably pretty clear. Like he may not be able to play after this, you know, having a traumatic brain injury could really do that. Um, Also, if, you know, if you're the insurance company, you're going to say, but all these other injuries he had, was he really healed from that? So we would want to, you know, that would start to get numbers down. And also, again, this is where we're just guessing and, uh, I want to reiterate, I hope Chandler Parsons is okay. Uh, But traumatic brain injury could just mean like concussion, right? Like is traumatic have a specific definition? It may. may. If if Chandler Parsons attorney, I I would have, you know, the neurological experts to back that up and talk about the long-term effects. But again, you know, a lot of this, um, a lot of it is very speculative and you're trying to narrow that down 
into reasonable. Like you, you're not going to have to prove it to a certainty, but a reasonable certainty. Like, you know, no, you're you weren't going to get a hundred fifty million dollar contract again. Yeah, but you also maybe weren't going to get the league minimum. You know, right. Well, I I, even so, if he did get the league minimum, so that I think that yeah. is a legitimate argument to take Chandler Parsons yeah. aside. There's certainly a scenario where one team brings him in another time uh, in his That's life better, on on right? the, on a veteran's minimum, and that is that is massive, substantial money uh, in the real world. You know, to make whatever one and a half million dollars, or it, it, I think it's even more for the years of service he already had. Uh, right. So yes, Chandler Parsons did possibly lose out on those uh, millions of dollars. So possibly this was a huge uh, substantial settlement. Well, anyway, Carl, uh, this is actually um, two years to the day when they announced that Chandler Parsons had hired Morgan and Morgan. And at that moment, no like the low hanging fruit grabber that I am, I said, man, I hope we get a commercial and lo and behold, we got one. It, it's out. So uh, good on that. yeah. Uh, thanks for, say, uh, yeah. Uh, the, only, the only thing I would say is, you know, when you hear substantial settlement, I think just remember that's marketing for yeah. Morgan and Morgan. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, Carl, thanks a bunch for uh, shining some light, shining some light yeah. on it and uh, talk to you another time. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. All right. Thanks, man. That was awesome. Cool. You having Are a good day? Not- yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, <not laughs> How are you? <laughs> uh, it's fine.